Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Books and Books in Coral Gables. Thank you all for coming down tonight. Uh, before, yes, thank you. Before um, we present the event, a quick uh, note for our internet audience at home. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, just call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you, and we'll ship it to you for free wherever you are in the United States. And also, later during the question and answer period, if you have a question for either of our speakers, call into the store and we'll see if we could uh, ask them for you. Tonight, Books and Books is very happy to present Mr. John Freeman and his new book, How to Read a Novelist. Uh, we're doing something very special tonight. Mr. Freeman is going to be interviewed by a good friend of Books and Books, the acclaimed novelist Edwidge Danticat. And here to introduce Mr. Freeman and Ms. Danticat, Please welcome to the microphone the author of the novels Vida and It's Not Love, It's Only Paris, Ms. Patricia Engel. Yes. I'm so excited to introduce to you tonight two writers whom I admire tremendously, John Freeman and Edwige Danticat. John Freeman has had a long and diverse career on all sides of the literary spectrum as one of the world's most prolific book critics, writing reviews for over 200 publications, as editor of the prestigious international literary journal Granta, as president of the National Book Critics Circle, and as a poet published in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, and elsewhere. His first book, The Tyranny of Email, is a fascinating study of the history of correspondence, showing us how today's casual technology can cut away at our personal freedom and intimate space in ways we might not realize. Just a month old, his new book, How to Read a Novelist, has already received glowing praise from the Boston Globe, the Los Angeles Review of Books, among other publications. This book is a collection of 55 encounters with some of the most talented and innovative minds in the literary world, such as Toni Morrison, Philip Roth, Margaret Atwood, and Jennifer Egan, among others. What makes these pieces so compelling is Freeman's gift for balancing the interview and author profile with compassion, humor, and his own personal insights, offering a rare window into the humanity behind some of the most beloved and studied works of contemporary literature. His passion for books is infectious, and the portraits in How to Read a Novelist are a thrilling read for both readers and writers, and an important addition to any book lover's library. If you are like me, you will devour How to Read a Novelist in one sitting and return to it again and again for all the gems packed inside. One of the many celebrated authors John Freeman interviews in How to Read a Novelist is Edwige Danticat. She's the author of numerous works of fiction and nonfiction, including Breath Eyes Memory, an Oprah Book Club pick, Crick Crack, a National Book Award finalist, The Farming of Bones, The Dew Breaker, Brother I'm Dying, which was a National Book Critics Circle Award winner and National Book Award finalist, and most recently, the beautiful and exquisitely written Claire of the Sea Light, which the New York Times calls haunting, fable-like, and powerful. She's also the recipient of MacArthur Genius Grant, the Story Prize, and too many other awards and honors to mention now. Born in Haiti, she emigrated to the United States at the age of 12 and is also an outspoken advocate for the Haitian people. And we are very lucky to call her one of our own here in Miami. Please join me in welcoming John Freeman and Edwige Danticat. To Miami, John. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Um, well, I'll have two takes on, on the interview. I was interviewing someone once who was, like you, was a, a friend of mine. And right before we went on, I said to him, I said, I'm not, I hope I don't ask you anything that will make you uncomfortable. And then he said, don't worry, whatever you ask me, I'll twist it and answer it however I like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then your take. Um, in this interview where you said an interview has a kind of intimacy and a trust can develop. Hopefully they say something that they haven't said before because they feel you might be the audience to understand that thought. So I'm hoping that you will say a bunch of things you haven't said before and, um, and we'll all be better for it. 
So I, how to read a novelist. I, like Patricia said, I love this kind of book because I'm very curious about people's process, how, how this craft, this task that we're all in, I'm, I'm always curious about how it um, works. So, and you say when you go to interview people, you don't really have many questions prepared, but since I'm not as expert as you, I prepared a few. So the first one, one question I wanted to ask you, since the book is called How to Read a Novelist, how um, we're always reading these days eulogies to the novel and to novelists. We're going to lose the novel to the internet, to radio way back when, and to books. And so um, is the novel dead? No, absolutely not. This bookstore is a testament to the fact that it's very much alive. And I think when people t say that, I always feel like they haven't read enough uh, because I, I think our culture tends to narrow us towards a certain mainstream the, or the idea of, of a kind of center. And there, there really is and never has been a center. There's just, there just was, I think, better uh, systems for projecting the idea that there was a center before. Uh, but now, thanks to the Internet, the fact that there are more books translated, uh, the fact that I think we don't necessarily have to have old fogey white guys being the main sort of storytellers who are telling us what we're doing in America. I think we have a, a much broader sense of our storytellers. And th there, there are many things that are bad about the death of the book review, but the, 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 the one thing that I think has come out of the, that is a slightly more democratized notion of where cultural um, intensity is happening. And it's everywhere. It's not just in New York. And this is why, when I worked at Grants, I put together an issue on Chicago, because I realized so many of the best young and not so young writers were writing from Chicago. And I think the, the novel is, obviously, storytelling is as old as human civilization. I mean, the first graphic novels were written on the inside of caves. And the novel, I think, developed as we had a sense of a sort of structured society in a place which had a, um, a, a kind of there was an economy for status, you know, and that people wanted to define themselves by who was in and who was out of a society. And that's when the novel took off in England and same, same thing in America. And I, but I think that that process is happening all over the world now in Brazil and in China and in India. And so for me to look at the health of the novel, you have to look at the novel globally uh, because not every, you know, in this, perhaps in the United States and to some degree, the novel doesn't have the power it does, but, it once had, but it, it culturally and, and, and what people think of it. But I think around the world, the novel is, is still very, very much alive. And what, in your opinion, makes a good novel? So you'll be teaching soon at Columbia class on structure of the novel. So what makes a good novel from your perspective? I just taught a novel last week that was told from the perspective of eight fictional lawyers who were being interviewed by one off-scene narrator. Uh, who went around asking them what the t what they talk about when they talk about law privately, and uh, and then the same week we read a novel set in a very contemporary south of France country house with a bunch of drunk rich people getting together while this young boy uh, is a, is quietly abused on the same day, and the novel sort of rotates around this abuse and it is a brilliant beautiful novel by this writer Edward Saint Alban. And I think both of those novels just have intensity and beauty and coherence, and they have the kind of sentences and story that only that writer could could tell. And I, I think it's wonderful that there are more and more writing programs um, because I think writers are far more proficient in craft than they ever have been uh, before. But I still think you have to be haunted and you have to be broken, not so much in yourself, but in uh, your sense of what the world is that a story has to be a bridge for something that's broken. It has to exist uh, to, to fill a lack, uh, a lack of coherence or um, something. And that's not something I think you can teach. I think you have to feel that. I think you have to inherit it or you have to live through it. Um, and so I, I can't teach my students that. I can't give them those experiences. But I can show them the kinds of novels um, that, that do that. And they're, they're incredibly diverse. There's no one type of novel, I think, that's brilliant. And so one of the joys of doing the interviews I did when I was writing a lot of these pieces is I could talk to people who had all different kinds of novels, from David Foster Wallace with his footnotes to 
you with your elliptical structures that accrete, you know, powerfully, and Margaret Atwood with her strange kind of slightly esoteric but haunting imagination. Um, and I, I, I think the diversity of the novel is its strength. Uh, you mentioned uh, writing programs. You know that these a lot of people really sometimes brutally criticize these, these programs. Are there some trends that, for better or worse, we're, we see merging in the novel that might be linked to writing programs or just to the general culture? Mm. Well, this is the reason why I'm teaching a class on structure. Uh, I think a lot of uh, programs focus on the level of the sentence. And it's like looking at a building and obsessing about the bricks. You know, there has to be a, some engineering. There has to be a, a kind of reason for it to exist. There has to be a sense of grandeur or beauty to it. And I, I think um, it's really easy to sort of focus on the, the tiny, tiny building blocks. But the, um, I, I think, if anything, the programs might overdo that focus on language to some degree. And language gets better as you write more. Uh, you, and you can't get better. You can't get that much better in two or three years. And, and t you, you have to make mistakes. You have to look back at your own work and be embarrassed, you know, to some degree. <laughs> I think to, to learn not to do that and um, putting together this book was really kind of embarrassing. It was like a dog returning to its vomit. You know, looking at these phrases I kept using over and over again uh, and, and having to cut them out. And, and I, that was my fault because not all of them were published or published in the same places. And so I went through periods where I just thought everything was really soulful. You know, I just get this sort of shimmer at my <laughs> at the inspiration of it all. And and um, spooky was another thing. And for some people, like with Haruki Murakami's work, I think it's appropriate. But I, not everything is so spooky. Or lyrical. Yeah, I limbed a lot of things uh, for a while, and then I, I cut that limb off. Um, so to the interview part of this, you interviewed... 55 writers, and sometimes in their homes, sometimes in different places, and um, I think Ishigu taught you how to like put jam on a scone and, and other, you, you tell wonderful anecdotes about these, in, the, these encounters. So how, how do you get, for, first, the elusive, you know, like the um, Robert Persick of Zen in, of the, in the Motorcycle, um, how do you get those kinds of folks to agree to be interviewed? Do you, do you seek out when you want to interview someone? Do you seek them out, or do they? Are you assigned? Um, some of them are. I, I sought out, and gr gradually, uh, after a while, it was clear that I wasn't a complete moron. I guess there's a style of interviewing where you want to catch someone with the food in their teeth, and you want to be like, "Ha, <laughs> you're just like us." And I don't think that's that interesting because, of course, writers are like us. Of course, they make mistakes. Of course, they have all the th problems that their characters have. If if writers were perfect, they wouldn't write novels. And, and I think. The best kinds of novels are saturated in, in this um, intense curiosity and intense forgiveness for the, all the qualities that we have as humans. We fail. That's what makes us human. And, uh, and so I think after a while of doing interviews, and it was clear I was not going to try to you know, put someone on the spot for something un completely un unrelated to their work, some people would say yes after a while. So Philip Roth, I, I first did a phone interview with him. And I had to sit, it was very strange, I had to sit in an unmarked office in a newspaper um, office, and I, he would just call this number, and they would forward me. So I, I couldn't, his number was blocked, and it was like he was sort of calling, it was like Moses' tablets had been materialized into Philip Ross' voice. And I was in this room by myself, with his, and I had a headset on, so it was like his voice was in my head, which it had been for a long time, because I read his books. And, and then I, I didn't, Screw that up enough, so uh, you know when it, his next book came out, and I asked, they let me interview him. Um, with, with someone like Robert Persig, they they just uh, someone called me and said, "Would you like to talk to him?" Because he was going to do one interview, and um, it was so I I went up to this hotel on the Charles in Boston and sat with him in this room with him and his wife. Interestingly, sometimes people bring their spouses. Uh, oh, really? Yes, <laughs> you can you can do that. Like David Foster Wallace came with his wife, um, I and mean a couple other people. One, per, um, Susanna Clark came with her husband. Uh, this, she wrote this really great book about magicians. Um, 
called uh, Miss Dr. Strange and Mr. Norrell. And I went and met her at a pub uh, like four hours outside of London. And I thought it was like 10 minutes outside of London. So I took an overnight flight, got on a train, went up to uh, some place with lots of pretty fields and farmhouses and went to a pub and was just completely jet lagged and thought, oh, I'll have, you know, chips and mushy peas which I thought I should do because I was in England for one of the first times and it was disgusting and I was sitting there and I was talking to them and he would answer some of the questions and he would say well we you know we were thinking and I thought whoa this is a very collaborative <laughs> process <laughs> and I couldn't say we back I thought we like that answer but then I realized that you know he, he was her teacher um, she had written this massive book and it was getting so much attention I can understand why someone would want to bring someone who could just slightly lessen the intensity of being in that seat and having to explain it all, all at once. And sometimes you get tired of saying the, the same things over, so it's... Yeah, actually, actually you know. your husband runs a translation agency, so he, should, he could probably just translate you <laughs> and come up with, with, with different answers, you know? It'd be like Google Translation, like translate it into Creole and back into English. It'd be a completely different answer. And, and from neurotic to human. <laughs> um, so... Wolf, in, in his interview with you, Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. And I think for writers, it would be first entertain. Entertain is a very simple word. I looked it up in the dictionary. Entertainment enables people to pass the time pleasantly. And any writing, I don't care if it's poetry or what, should entertain. It's a recent thing that there's a premium put on making writing so difficult. Only a charmed aristocracy is capable of understanding it. So what, in your opinion, should be a writer's hi Hippocratic oath? Or maybe we should say hypocritical oath. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it, it sh should involve being curious. Uh, and I think, um, you know, writers, I, th I th hope, the best ones tell you something that you don't already know or tell you things you already know and make it more mysterious. And I think in order to do that, they have to invent characters and write about relationships in a entertaining way. I think it, I think all books have to be entertaining. Toni Morrison is entertaining, even though some of her books for the first 100 pages, you're a little unclear as who's what and what's happening. But it's a different form of entertainment. It's an entertainment that takes more work, and I think out of that work is, is more pleasure. But with writers, I think the, if they have a, an oath, it, it should be to, to, um, to, to be curious about human beings. And I, I, satire is really fun to read sometimes, but I, I was just reading a book on the way down. It was a really big book of stories, and there's some satirical stories in there. And I, I sometimes felt the writer just clubbing his characters. Um, you know, and it, it sort of lost my interest for a while because I, I think it's very easy to, to make fun of people um, or, and to, to turn people into types. And I think that's, that's what our pop culture does to some degree. And I think a, a novel should make people very much more mysterious from from the outside looking in. Are there some shared experiences among all the writers you've uh, you've interviewed? Some nuggets that you can share? Well, a certain like at least almost a half a dozen of the male writers brought up Michiko Kakatani and John Updike who had a stammer. It was it was the only time in four interviews that I had with him that that he stammered. He's like Micha, Michiko Kaka Kaka <laughs> Yeah, and she's she's famous for giving these really negative reviews, and so um, that that was a, a running. Norman Mailer talked about her. Philip Roth. Uh, it was a certain generation, I think, feared her, and I think to some degree resented her authority because she could kill a book, you know, as the New York Times often does when they run a review two weeks before the book's out. And um, but more broadly, I think failure was a really uh, uh, common thread, as in that. People were often, they didn't know what they were doing. Like uh, Mark Danielewski wrote this amazing um, postmodern novel called House of Leaves, which is a kind of horror story uh, about a fake film that an old man writes about. It's not a real film. And this L.A. tattoo artist discovers the manuscript of this guy's dissertation about this fake film. And it, it becomes a kind of maze of a book. And as, you know, as I, was, I was talking to him when the fir book first came out, he didn't even know he was writing a book. He thought he was maybe writing a poem, maybe making a screenplay or something. And when a book is done, you see it on the shelf and it has that kind of weight and mass and uh, that sort of sense of inevitability. 
especially you know when you read the sentences and they're beautiful uh you think god this is this this is like one of those monuments you know it's like stonehenge it's always been here you know you can't imagine who built it and it's as a reader it's fascinating but as a writer it's incredibly um cheering to know that even the really best people feel lost and fail and doubt themselves all the all the best people doubt themselves and i think the doubt like with faith is essential to the actual enterprise and, and i think that's probably one of the many reasons that writers have vices right like you need and well, you don't have and any <laughs> i don't think you have any well we won't talk about that <laughs> but uh <laughs> But I think I, I think since the internet conversation will start. It's <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, it's sort of this duality of total vulnerability and total sort of lack of confidence. People, you know, writers are very sensitive. And I think that's part of criticism too, the way people react to criticism. But you have to almost be overconfident that you will sit down and sit down every day, and something worthwhile will keep coming out. And I, so I, I, think, I think sometimes people need something to get them over that, that bump. We won't get into writers' mental illnesses. They, <laughs> not much of that was discussed in there. But I want to continue maybe a little bit along the line of reviewers and reviews and crit critical reactions, because this week, sort of inside um, publishing gossip, I guess uh, this week, uh, Isaac Fitzgerald Gaddy, uh, who was at the website The Rumpus, he was an editor there, and then he was working for McSweeney's very briefly and, and became book editor at BuzzFeed, the website, and there was this whole oopla because he said that uh, they won't do negative book reviews because there's enough smack and snark about yay for him. Um, but um, people reacted very sort of strangely about not, I mean, strangely for me, because I think writers would love to have just positive <laughs> book reviews, but um, people are saying, well, you know, are reviews too nice? Or are they not nice enough? So where do you stand on the specter of, you know, negative versus positive reviews? Reinforcing, like, reviewing only a book you love versus, like, I am going to take down this book that everybody seems to love. I think those books will take themselves down. I think there's this feeling like, because the space for print book reviews and just book reviews in general is so compacted, there is this feeling that there ought to be assassins out there, you know, shooting the, the sort of last wildebeest which are wandering around, eating up all the, the, the luscious vegetables which could have been, you know, nourishing better, smaller, more diverse animals. And the fact of the matter is, you know, a book like Inherent Vice, which I love, the new Thomas Pynchon, came out and typically in the past that would get about a hundred reviews and I feel like I've only read about 15 and yeah you see the same yeah. ones in this and so in that w environment where books book coverage is so um, rare it, it used to get it every day in some newspapers and now there's not even weekend sections in many places um, why 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 spend time destroying something you know why, if you can, here's an example, and this is, I, I reviewed a book by William Gass called Middle Sea, and I love his essays. I think he's probably one of the best living American essayists, and he makes you want to read more than almost anyone I know of. His novels are harder work, and I, I really wanted to like this novel. I read some of the start, and then I was reviewing it for a, pub for a publication, and I got into it, and I, was, I, start, I stopped liking it, and I said, I, I really want to not review this book. I said this to my editor, and they said, no, no, please, John, continue. And I said, well, okay, he's 89 years old. You know, probably 4,200 people in America know that he's a novelist. Why do I have to s explain to all your other audience that he's a novelist and that you shouldn't read him? What's the point of that? It took him 10 years with arthritis. It took him 25 years. And so I, I, he said, you know, we will have no credibility if we don't run negative reviews. And so I sort of, you know, I said I was going to do it, so I did it, and I tried to spend as much time directing people to his other books while reviewing this book. And I think there's there's the publications which feel like they won't have any authority if they don't kill things. Um, and then I th I think there's the reality that no one walks into a bookstore being like, I want to find something I hate, you know. 
Oh, I hate that so much. I, oh, I really just want to touch this book. I heard about it. It was so bad. And I, so I've, I, I always operate on the, because I get to choose a lot of the books I'm reviewing. I, I really try to review the books I, I think I'm going to like. Because I, I would never go into a bookstore thinking I, I want to read something I don't like. Or I, you know, I don't, I don't even go to movies that way, which are, you know, there's a way to hate and love a big popcorn film, but books are different. They're made by one person. They take years and years and years to make, and it's so easy to demolish them. You just put explosion charges on the right joists, and the whole thing comes down. And you can sit there and sort of congratulate yourself on the mess you made. But in fact, there's, you know, that's, that's someone's life there. And it doesn't mean that to review books you have to be a nice person and that everyone's okay, everyone's good. But there are enough books out there that you can choose the ones which are good and and write well about them. It's it's a lot harder to praise something than to, than to destroy it. And I think it's it's easier to do if you've not gone through that whole process of watch someone labor at at it for for very long. It's like a I big mean, chunk of somebody's life. There are lifelong, um, you know nasty book reviewers but if you notice there there tends to be waves of people and they're and they're always between age 24 and 41 who come up and they have a strong voice and they go through with their blowtorch you know basically trying to melt a few people's faces off dale peck did this and he's a very good novelist you know he was um and there, there's just cycles of people, the, the killers that get out there. And, and there are certain book review editors who love to, to set their attack dogs on people because they can just be like, that's, not, that's just my pit bull. I'm sorry. That's its nature. But it's like, no, you bought that pit bull. That's your dog. It's, you're responsible for what it's doing. And I think you know, there's two attitudes to culture. The culture is a war, you know, that things have to be killed in order to make space for other things. And then there's the other attitude, which is like, you know, it's life is short. Praise, praise what's good. I think there's, there's also sort of this sort of sacred cow argument. Let's take down some sacred cows. Um, so before we go to uh, the audience for some questions, so the book is called How to Read a Novelist versus How to Read a Novel. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it would be the difference between those two, how to read a novel versus how to read a novelist? And also, how do you read a novelist? Well, um, I, I titled the book that because they're profiles. And I, to back up a tiny bit, I went to college when literary theory was in its sort of heyday, and you never could read a book without a piece of, or seven pieces theory ta attached to you, like some sort of technology. You're like a bionic reader, you know? And you would, we would go through some whole classes without even really talking about the book. And the author was supposedly out of the picture. And... Yeah. Yeah, and I, I w I've always found it much more interesting to think that this is made by one person. This is hu m human made, and their life somehow filtered into this in some way, you know. And so I, I ended up doing a lot of profiles, you know, because I, I ended up probably writing 300 and chose this f from that bigger group, and because I kept, I kept finding it fascinating to see how some people were deeply influenced by their life and some weren't. Uh, and I think when we read novels, especially when if, if it's a good one, I always end up flipping to the back, just looking at the person, you know, because it's a very, very intimate experience. And you're in, they're in your head because they're giving you things that you imagine. And you're, you're somehow in, in their head because you're this reader that's out there that they're writing for in a very opaque uh, but intimate way. And so you keep looking at the page, like, who's in my head? And... Uh, you know, I was, the last time I did this was with this book by David Van, The Legend of a Suicide. Um, and I was doing it on the way down because T.C. Boyle's face was on the cover of the book, so it was impossible. It's like, <laughs> wow, that's awesome hair. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I do think that, for me, I, reviews get out of control and, and sort of unnecessarily nasty when it's, when it's, when the, when the um, reviewer thinks I have no duty to the writer at all. And they don't. I don't. You're not writing as a reviewer for the writer. You're, you're never going to tell them something they haven't already thought about. And in fact, most of them probably don't even read your reviews. And yet, you, we are in the same... Without them as reviewers, you don't exist. And so I think the reviewers and, and novelists are they're doing the same thing. We're both working with language. We're both using similes and metaphors. We're both telling stories. And as a reviewer, you're telling the story of what it's like to re review someone's book. And so I put this together, hope, 
you know, I hope for readers that are of the type that are just curious about um, not just the book as an object, as this sort of thing sitting there, but as a book that's been part of someone's life that they wrote for intense personal reasons, that's part of an overarching project, and that maybe hearing about that author's life will, will somehow make it better. Thank you. So um, now we'll take questions from the audience. There'll be special instructions. <laughs> Easy instructions. Folks, if you have a question or a comment, please raise your hand and let me get to you with the microphone so that the internet audience will be able to hear you at home. As you see, you'll not be able to hear yourself in the house, so don't worry about that, but we do need it for the internet viewers. Anyone that wants to go first, I know the beginning is always tough. Here we go. Well, since you mentioned um, essays and fiction and nonfiction, um, I belong to a critique group, which a lot of writers belong to, and uh, you have to learn how to critique as much as you do have to write. And um, this is a question maybe from your perspective to say, uh, I've just started to write maybe some nonfiction, more of a dabble, but critiquing and reading nonfiction versus fiction, there's a big difference between the technical aspects and critiquing what that person is writing about, meaning their life or their experiences. Do you have any advice for somebody in that situation who is looking at nonfiction and, you know, I know that has to be a good story, right? Everything has to be a good story, but just some perspective on that. Well, I think you should probably, you've written so many different types of nonfiction. Um, from memoir to essays to <coughs> occasional sort of introductions. and Have you written book reviews? Just recently one, yeah. Really? <laughs> was yeah. it really, was it, was it a, a bad review? Oh, no. It was, uh, it was actually my first ever Publishers Weekly for Radiance of Tomorrow, Ishmael Bay's new novel, which I loved. So it was easy. I, it depends on the nonfiction that you're writing. I, I think writing about your life is is a lot harder than it would at first seem, especially if what you're writing about is very recent. And so, I, I, and I think the one piece of advice I would have about that is that you can never, you have to be giving the reader something. That you can never be asking the reader for something in advance of giving them something. So, uh, in the sense that I think when, when we tell stories about ourselves, we're often looking for expiation. We're looking for some sort of sense that we're we're okay and you can't ask the reader for that um, all you have to do is is tell a good story and i think that means often that you have to write through what you're trying to write about and then go back and edit out the things which maybe should be told to a therapist <laughs> rather than to your audience yeah. i think as for critiquing and reviewing i think just to always remember that it's not simply a a sort of list of pluses and minuses that um that you have to sort of, a, a book review has to have an arc and a shape, just like an essay or a poem or a, no, or a short story. It has to have a good lead, an entry point, something that makes people keep reading. Has to, uh, it has to raise a question fairly early on that only you reading to the end will answer. And it has to use language as richly and, uh, and robustly as um, I think the, the actual thing it's writing about, it, whether it's a novel or a, a play or a, a, a movie or something because I think um, when book reviews get boring it's because they start to get coldly analytic you know it's like a sort of diagnostic sort of you know thing tunnel that that you're just rolling something through and I think one of some of the best critics you know I don't always agree with James Wood but he writes like how he's a fantastic writer because he uses language well um, and I think some of the best reviewers, Mary McCarthy, Zadie Smith, they use language uh, at the level of the, of the thing that they're writing about. And so if you're writing something critical or critiquing, try to keep writing as if you're writing a poem. You know, don't be, don't be afraid of using similes and metaphors because that's the way that you 
collapse the gap between you and the reader. And also, you're, you're in a group, right? And I think sometimes in a group, it's, it's like writing workshop, and you have to also be conscious of where the person is in the process, because sometimes even when I'm teaching, I see people come in with their sort of nascent baby writing, and, and I just know that the class is going to kill it, you know, <laughs> or the group is going to just club it to death. So I think you also have to be conscious of where the person, when they're coming in with the thing, where they are in it, and, and in order to respond to it. And, and if it's a nonfiction group, it reminds me of my whole editorial process with my, with my editor, Robin Desser at Kanab. So I was, it was the first time I was doing memoir, and, I, and it was about my father dying, my uncle dying, my daughter being born. So I remember Robin is one of those very last editors who just writes you like 12 page letters but with the with this was the most those letters were the most careful because she would say with three you know because it was about my life you know we we're talking about actual experiences so I think it, you have to also realize what the what the person is dealing with if it's nonfiction if it's per really deeply personal where they're coming from so you don't really kill their idea or shame them or something. You have to really be conscientious of the personal element of that in a way that you might not, you know, sort of would be addressing more just the technical elements in fiction. Um, <clears throat> so where do you find or how do you find the balance between like not overdoing the criticism of the writer because as you say is the writers you know it's a part of their life whether fiction or nonfiction that it's a part of their life that they put in that piece of work but at the same time the reader of the review is counting on you to tell them whether it's worth it to you know where to put this number on where to put this book on the on the list you know should I read it now or should I read these two others first for example um, I remember when Jonathan Franzen wrote um, Freedom, there was a cover in Time magazine, and he was on the cover, and that cover said, America's Great Novelist. And I had not never heard of him, and he's like, I have to read this book. He's America's Great Novelist. And I couldn't get through the book, um, which is a statement about me, not about him as a novelist, but however. But then, then later I read in a Huffington Post, 10 reasons why, you know, freedom sucks, something like that. Uh, and then, you know, reading the two extremes kind of got me to the balance. So uh, long story short, how do you find that balance between honoring the producer of the work and serving your reader? Yeah, I, as a book reviewer, you, you have two um, loyalties. One, the most, Im the most important one is to the reader, the person who's reading the paper on Sunday or picking up a magazine or listening to your voice on a radio because they have to decide whether they want to put down 27.95 or whatever for that book and that completely trumps the author you know the, as a reviewer you're not there to to protect the writer's feelings um, you know this is this is not a battle but it's you basically have to be accurate to your experience of reading the book um, I think where the loyalty to the author comes is in trying as best you can to understand what the author set out to do and then judging them on that rather than on what you wish the book were. So don't try to make Jonathan Franz and a Marilyn Robinson or you know, slim-sized novelist. He's never going to write that kind of novel. Or don't try to make Jonathan Franz and um, you know, wildly globetrotting and, on a, and sort of internationally American. I mean, maybe that's what his life is like, but he's going to write American books. Um, and so I, I think with a, with a book review, you have to, know, to, to think really hard if the problem with the book is your problem as a reader or if it's a problem with the execution of the book. And it's a hard job because you, you have like a, you know, I reviewed Freedom and I had about 10 days to read it. And I was writing it um, on a deadline, and there's this great fear, and this is, I think, a good fear, but that I like maybe I wasn't getting it because I gave it a mixed review. I thought some of it, parts of it, were brilliant and e improvements on the corrections, and I thought other parts, not so much. Um, 
And I think the problem happens when you put someone on the cover of Time magazine. It's almost as if you're saying, this book is for everyone. And I, I really would be surprised, even with the Bible. Like, there, there is no book for everyone. You know, there are lots of different books. And I think that's why I, you know, I, I liked when I was working primarily as a book critic that I wrote for a lot of papers and I had a lot of different, different types of assignments. Uh, because I, for me, I, my taste is all over the map. Um, it runs from Edwidge Danica to Edwidge Danica, and <laughs> <laughs> everywhere in between. But it, it's, I, I, I think that I am always skeptical of that kind of uh, moment, you know. The Nobel Prize always produces that kind of anxiety, because it, it, everyone says, like, is this the best writer in the world? No, it's not. It's the best writer that the 19 people in Stockholm who have been deliberating since May feel is, is worth the prize now. So I, I think y your best bet is to look for people whose taste you like in, in a book review um, or on radio or on television who are rec recommending books or your, even your friends. Because uh, you have some friends, don't you, that are like recommend everything. Like, oh, this is so good. You totally have to read this. And I think, no, I'm not going to read a 900-page fantasy novel. I'm glad you like that kind of fiction, but it's, not, it's, it's never going to work for me. So I think... Uh, as a reviewer, you have to uh, describe the book as carefully as po like what you're doing is basically a description. Criticism, if you describe a book very, very faithfully and your experience of reading it, um, I think you, sh you should never give someone the impression that the book's not for them uh, because you're, what, what is on the page is, is an exact replica of your experience of reading the book. If you're used to reading a whole range of critics, you realize like whose tastes lean more towards yours, right? So you're not going to go to certain people to say, "Oh, I know they're reading." You know, we're not. We don't have. You realize after all, like we don't have the same taste in books as somebody, and that's in everything. John, this is something that's always intrigued me about crit criticism and reviews: is that you feel that the balance has to be struck not just with analyzing the work as best you can for the reader, reader, but the reviewer also has to insert themselves to a certain amount because the reader is reading you for your judgment and your view. Is that is that correct? You feel that there has to be some John Freeman in the review and not just a book report for it? <laughs> yeah, I, I've always admired critics like this who could write with a very strong voice. Like the, uh, There's a guy who's actually in the audience who said, the subject of every book review is me. <laughs> And I, and I, I, I always, because I'm not, I don't find myself, <laughs> even though I'm talking on a microphone on stage, <laughs> that interesting. And I, f I always felt like what I could do best was, was to try to use language to evoke the book um, and, and sort of be, be like a light um, rather than a, a mirror, you know, if anything. Uh, and whenever I would use the first person, um, uh, th most editors would cut it out. They're like, oh, I'll just lop that graph off and stop, start here. And w one of the most um, painful <laughs> moments of that was I had a book review due on September 11th. <laughs> and I shouldn't laugh, but it was uh, my, my editor. Everyone's calling, worrying about like what's happened. My, I was living about a mile from the trade towers. Phones start working, and the first call I get is from s this guy in San Francisco who's still a friend who said, Hey, you gonna turn that book review in today? I can see the smoldering <laughs> remains of the towers from my window, and I was like, "Wow!" <laughs> and the book I was re reviewing was this book by Dennis Bach called *The Ash Garden*, which is a really beautiful kind of triptych of a novel about the sort of aftermath of Hiroshima. Uh, and I had re I'd read the book, and I was starting that morning to write the review, and then this happened, and I, and so I th the only way I could see getting into the book was to tie it to re very very recent current events, and and. I sent it to my editor, and he, <laughs> he got the first paragraph off. Because I think newspapers labor under the, um, even, even the critical pages, labor under the, the fallacy of complete objective journalism. And, and so you have this kind of everywhere but nowhere voice. Uh, and I try to go a little bit away from that, but not all on the side of, um, sub of, of completely announced subjective uh, experience because I don't, I've I've never found out how to write funny, how to write with a really strong version of my speaking voice. Can I, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I know I'm going to ramble a lot because a lot of what you've said uh, is uh, is exactly the way I feel about what we're all about and what we're doing. And I speak a little bit from the customer's point of view, the reader's point of view, because I see that every single day. And I think um, it's clear to me uh, that there is so much good, good writing that is being published these days. And I find that literary journalism is shrinking so incredibly much that it's almost pointless and fruitless to take on somebody and write a bad review of a book because of what you said before where you see yourself more as a light. And I think what, what we're not able to do as an industry or as a literary culture, we don't have the means to really be able to shine that light on enough of the really great books that are out there. So those books don't get that light. And whenever I see somebody taking up valuable space, valuable literary real estate, to just trash something, I feel what a lost opportunity to a large extent. I see this, I, you know, the New York Times book review is one, is the, one of the last big freestanding book reviews. And occasionally they'll have a first novel in there, not a particularly the best first novel that's out the year, but for some reason it's assigned, and then it gets a 1,200-word mostly negative review. And I think wow, you could have cut that in half and had two really positive 600-page, 600 600-word 600 reviews. And I think it's, a lot of it is about that, 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 that standard. And I, you know, I think the, the problem about the world we're in now is, is basically the book reviews are preaching to the people who already know they love and want to find books. And what I loved about writing for the Sun Sentinel or, you know, the Plain Dealer in Cleveland or you know the New Mexican and 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 Albuquerque was that I could feel like maybe someone would just stumble on a book review and not because maybe they've decided to have a longer breakfast and it would just be yet another piece of news and now we're we're at, we're all you know the 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 this, the core of literary readers are all reading they're all s this, the same things. Well, the other thing that you've done, which I think is really important is as being a chronicler of literary lives. That's the other thing that we're losing in, in our culture is we're losing the ability to understand who came before us. And the fact that you've written about people who are no longer alive, people that you've had an opportunity to meet years and years ago, I think that's a service, uh, not that you're, <laughs> you know, not, not that I'm putting you, a, you know, in that, not that you did this as a service, but it's providing a really, really valuable document of literary history. And that worries me as someone who's been doing this now for about 30 years or so. And you see who people were reading 30 years ago who have just completely fallen off the map and nobody even talks about them or thinks about them. Or, and they're wonderful. The memory hole for literary culture is, is really broad. And, and I mean, the, the, every year there's more writers falling in it. You know, and it's everyone from, remember William Wharton, who wrote Birdie and Dad? I, you know, strange novelist, but really beautiful writer. And I don't, you know, you don't ever see his books in stores. And I, it's because of the everyone shopping online or using e-books, and, and because of the fact that the stores, like this one has m remained strong because it's part of the community, but you go into a lot of stores and the backlist isn't there either because people will just get it on Kindle. And so these writers that if you're if they're not selling you know, on Kindle and they're not in the stores and their books are you know not in used bookstores which are not around that much anymore it's like they don't even exist and so I I I've I like the idea of uh, there being a continuum it reassures me we have the book editor of the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel he used to be here Chauncey is here yes, I and I know he did. <laughs> And we have lost, I mean, we still are fortunate to have a, a book uh, uh, page at the Miami Herald. But what we've lost by not having these book editors who are encouraging off-the-book page pieces uh, is, is we're, we're losing so much and people don't really realize it. Because readers want guides. And they're not going to be reading reviews as much as they are as much as they are uh, 
portraits of writers. And what they learn by reading a portrait of a writer is so much more for some of them than they learn through a review. And that spurs them to want to read even more. So we mourn the loss of <laughs> Chauncey <laughs> at the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, but we've gained him here in Dade County, so we're happy about that. I did, uh, I did, but, um, well, actually, what I was going to say is, in response to what he said, really wasn't what you said, which was that some writers are really important in the public, and sometimes they take make a, a document that needs to be trashed. I, and I was thinking of Nat Turner, that by Styron, oh, yeah. and it needed to be trashed because he got so much. Uh, Pulitzer for it. Yeah, Pulitzer. Yeah. So I, I think there are some exceptions, and that to me is one big exception. Yeah, I think uh, I, there are moments when the whole culture is seems diluted, and a, and a single voice can be uh, can can give everyone's voices of doubt and themselves uh, a, a, a sense of relief that they're not crazy that this that this and I think um, it's so for me it, it seems very rare in books uh, although I've, I had a similar situation like this um, with this book called uh, I don't know, it's not even worth it's a book that I thought if you had changed it changed the title from Islam to Judaism would be a book that could have been published in Germany in 1939. And it was this horrendously Islamophobic book uh, that it was, and that word is so loaded, but it was basically just wielding all kinds of really crude racial stereotypes. And then it became up, it, it was nominated for this book prize that I was president of. And so I, I, I ended up writing something because I just thought, this, I'm embarrassed by this. How does this, how does this happen? So I think there are elements of culture where they need to be debated in public. My my worry is that because the culture itself has become so argumentative and that people, you know, you watch television or radio or, you know, the opinion pages, like you watch what happened to Obamacare, like everything is de is debated uh, as, as if there are no stakes, that the, 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 the real value is not in the thing, it's in the debate. And uh, I think... For some books, like Styron's book and, and others, that is a very valid, I think, exercise in, in public. But for a lot of them, it's it's getting away from the actual thing. At the risk of going a little off the, the, the topic, I'm, I'm, um, I think almost any time the subject of the novel comes up, I, I think about this whole sociological aspect of it that uh, you know, we just take it totally for granted as if novels have been here you know, from the beginning. And you know, there's this whole view of the novel as kind of an artifact of the last 500 years. You know, the invention of the printing press, you know, the first literary form to be in prose rather than verse. And then you know, it's this private individual kind of experience and the, the, the narratives are very you know, individualistic and so on. And I'm just wondering about, um, uh, as you know, everything that has a beginning has an end, and you know, as we're kind of going into this whole new phase of whatever it is, I think where literacy itself is kind of being, you know, redef redefined. I'm wondering what your thoughts might be in terms of like the future of the novel as a form at all, and then consequently, what the view, what the future of reviewers will be in that kind of context? Um, that's a great question, because I think uh, the novel has always been, I, I think the novel is a social document, and it, and it depends on society in order to exist. It, and it, it was at its strongest point when, it, when society is, is in debate with itself about what it is. And so this is why, you know, novelists like Toni Morrison and William Faulkner and 
you know, Mark Twain are so important to us because they're debating that in their books they give us the contradictions of being American, for example. And I think as technology changes, I think the novel has to change because our sense of interior life changes. And I think the novel's great strength that sh it 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 can show us in a way what it feels like to be alive. And I I you know. And that, that form has changed a lot in just a very short time. And I think of Gene Toomer's Cain, which you, which you quote at the beginning of your book. And it is a, you read it now, and it's a crazy book. It's like poems. It's sort of songs. It's sort of prose passages. And it's really just a long elegy. And, you know, Ed, Ed Weege in her new book has, I think, found a way to update that and make it sort of whole uh, and yet still feel like a novel. Um, but I, I sort of don't buy into the idea that the that literary at, uh, life has a kind of progression. Like the, you move, as society moves through different stages of development, that the novel has to move in tandem with it, and that it um, that certain modes of of narration, like the sort of nineteenth century close third person, which was used by Dickens and Jane Austen and everyone, is is out of out of date because you see. Sorry, with Jonathan Franzen or Jeff Eugenides or Jane Smiley, or you know, they can bring it back. Um, you know, Ed Donna's, heart. Donna's heart. You know, your book, new book reminds me of Dubliners, to some degree. You know, this sort of circular way of evoking a place. So I think novels will continue to be written, but I think there will be the biggest change will be in the readers, their attention span, how they read the novel, what they read it on whether there will be bookstores or if bookstores will have espresso book machines that print novels as you buy a coffee, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, I think the biggest, my biggest worry is about literacy itself, you know, and, and how there's this, you know, aside from Obamacare, I just feel like there's the uh, attack on the public collective space, the public good, and the government being part of that has been so successful that we just let our public education get to an, a really terrible place. Teachers are paid really poorly. Students are not taught to read as well. The book, people spend more time debating whether there's you know, certain books on the syllabus rather than actually reading the books. And so we're not developing a group of readers. And, it's, and I don't say readers as, as people as a form of leisure. I think of reading as a form of thinking, as a form of engagement, of being in life. And you know that that carries over from reading novels to reading newspapers to being informed to making informed decisions as voters, and so I, I sometimes get incredibly. Do you feel like this? I get incredibly de depressed. I think there's just this miasma of kind of, you know, lights and things, and 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 fewer and fewer readers, and it makes it easier and easier for a country like ours to now have like the biggest disparity between the the poor and the rich that it's ever had since the depression. And I think that is a very unsustainable, extremely unsustainable gap. And that, I, I've, I've completely wandered off topic here, but I think it does relate to reading and the future of the novel because the, the novel, I think, really came back with force when, when this same gap was existing. Well, I have a question that sort of dovetails off of that, which is, you know, we here at the store, we're sort of preoccupied every day with the paradigm shifts that are taking place. and the changes in book culture and book selling. Uh, so this might be an impossible question for you, but where do you imagine things are going in book culture? How will reviews proliferate? How will criticism proliferate? Do you think it's going to be blogs? Do you think it might be websites? Everything, it seems like things are going to be more fragmented than like what you were saying at the beginning about a sort of consensus culture and a consensus critical opinion just any musings for either of you, any musings on where you think criticism and book culture, where it's going to be going next? What's the difference between, say, when Breath Eyes Memory came out and got reviews or Farming of Bones and, and this new book, your experience of being reviewed and talking about it? Or do you, do you not count them? Oh, no, I, I count them. I mean, I think Breath Eyes Memory was almost 20 years ago. There were no blogs. There were no, uh, you know, there's, there's not that whole life on the Internet, which I think, you know, 
Now, when reviews came out for Birth, Eyes, Memory, they literally, the publisher had to pack them, print, copy them, put them in an envelope, and send them to me. And I could say, you know, sometimes they, were, they would protect me, they didn't send me everything. But now, if like a high school student writes a, a couple of phrases, someone will say, oh, look what they're writing about you in Timbuktu, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I think, in, in some ways, it's, there are things that we didn't have before, too, like Goodreads and Amazon and those. Like, it's more democratic in many ways, in that every reader who wants a say gets it, you know, gets a say somewhere um, online. So there are more, I mean, there are more, there are more voices, and I think there, there are more ways for readers to make their, their feeling no, feelings known. Definitely 20 years ago, it was sort of, there were more these, okay, this is the person who is assigned to review your book, and... And now anyone, anyone can. And I think in some ways that's a good thing because it goes to the core of what you're saying about, you know, maybe, you know, the, the issue of literacy. You know, you might have maybe a smaller readership, but it's probably a more engaged readership. You know, they're very vocal if they hate a book or if they love it. And, and so there are all these different avenues to hear from the people who are reading the book that, that there didn't exist before. Mm. You're so optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a there's a constant oscillation between oral and written culture, and we're we're moving back towards written culture, even though we're, we're not. So more and more people are writing things down which they would have said. So Goodreads is a kind of um, networked version of what was previously already happening, which is that people recommended books to other people. And now there's this technology which means that you can recommend books to people you don't even know. And because they're like, oh, I like your picture, boop, you know, and then, you know, you're connected. And so y there are, there's a more diffuse sense of community. And yet I think the more in, that um, our sense of community with a big C is, is, is spread out, the more we need places like independent bookstores. Uh, you know, I think. I wrote about this a little bit in my first book, but I think that this is like the best, not my face, but like this is the best interface ever created. You know what I'm thinking when I'm looking at you, when I'm speaking to you, when I'm making eye contact, when I'm using my hands, you know, when I'm crying or something. You, you, this, th it tells you what I'm thinking. And yet we, we spend more and more of our time behind these screens and, you know, and I, I, don't, d I don't discount that because there, there are some incredibly wonderful things about the internet. It's like the biggest brain ever created. It's like the most accessible library you know, for the world in, in its best moments. But because the, this virtual world we've created, this kind of anodyne to ourself, is, is, is this big machine and it's also a business, uh, it's running away with, with our real life, you know, which is that you buy something on Amazon, okay, fine, then you don't go to your hardware store. You start shopping on, on, on you know, bestbuy.com and so you don't go to the electronics store and those stores close down and you wonder why your street looks the same and I think the same thing happens with our literary culture you buy on Amazon you okay great it's accessible you get you know Amazon Prime but don't complain when your bookstore locally closes down it's the same thing with book reviews like okay you want to have every book review in the world accessible on the internet great but you know good luck trying to Buy, you know, pick up a newspaper on the corner and, and be able to read about it. These are choices. We're making these choices. We're making the world as we want it. Um, you know, but I think eventually it, 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 it will have a momentum that we won't be able to stop. And as much as I love the fact that now if you're a 19-year-old living in Oklahoma who's read my book and doesn't like it, and you can write a book review or a blog and post it somewhere, I, I think that kind of feedback is great. I think it's the more voices, the better. On the other hand, not everyone is um, a trained book reviewer. And it's not, um, it's, this is not about, there's this clash, I think, between democracy and, uh, and critical engagement and, and criticism. We think, oh, it's, you're, being, you're being elitist when you say things like that. No, w you wouldn't let a brain surgeon just pop up out of nowhere in Oklahoma, uh, but you, for some reason, just no, I, I'm, I know, I, and, but no, but you, okay, 
But I, I'll tell you, I'm optimistic because we can see the change right here in this bookstore. I think I've been coming to this bookstore for more than 20 years. And the fact that people can watch us now on the internet, the internet folks are watching us, because Mitchell Kaplan, who had the long question, um, <laughs> is the bookstore owner and thought, you know, let me open this up. I think the fact that he decided to participate in this technology allows these nice folks who are watching us out there to be able to no, see I us. No, I think that's an... Uh, I have to say, hats off to you guys for doing this, because it literary events are, you know, if you're two hours away, you can't go, you know, typically, unless you're it's someone that you really, 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 really have to see, and you can clear your night. And so, to me, this is the best, one of the best ways for a bookstore to use the internet. But I also felt like um, literary culture, you know, I didn't grow up in New York or anywhere. Fan I grew up in Sacramento, California, in Cleveland. Like, I didn't, I didn't meet li living writers, you know. I didn't know that writers, they're, I'm sure they were all around when I was growing up. But literary culture always felt like it was over there, it was somewhere else. And I think the one great thing, or one of the great things about the inter internet is it makes it closer. You feel like you're, you know, you can download a video of Jam Kotzia giving a lecture somewhere. You can see Paul Oster interviewed on the internet. You can see Ed Weege interviewed on the internet. And I, I think that makes it, it brings it a lot closer. And the reason why I put this book together as a book is I felt like when I first read a book of author interviews, the Paris Review interviews, I just felt like, wow, this makes it seem like it's just ongoing, that there's this world out there that I'm, I can be part of by reading about it. And, you know, now I'm sitting here next to you. And not you, and I think we're wrapping it up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Speaking of our internet audience, uh, remember you could call the number on your screen and purchase a copy of the book. We'll have John sign it for you and we'll send it to you wherever you are in the United States for free. Also, when we live stream an event, they're all archived on that website. So if you don't get to watch it live, you could go to the Books and Books homepage, go to that um, uh, live streaming link and all the events that have been live streamed will be there archived for you to see whenever you wish. For those of you here in the house, we have How to Read a Novelist for Sale over there at the counter. He's going to be signing over there at the table to the left of uh, the stools. And please, this was fascinating. It's the type of thing we love to have here at the store. Let's give them both another hand. Thank you very much.